first myth that we want to cover is the myth of the perfect partner. Wouldn't that be nice if you had the perfect partner for you, that it'd be like problem free and just... Second myth, <laughs> do you feel the love? If she would just care about my mind. <laughs> you know, seriously, sometimes I think all she thinks about is my body. It just... <laughs> just gosh. Seriously, uh, there are shallow things that we wish uh, for, and we just think, you know, if they just, that just, it's aggravating. But on a more serious note, right, it doesn't stop there. We also have those wishes of if they would just, you know, dot, 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 at a deeper level. Things like if my spouse would just be more caring. There will always be moments within any close relationship where it's going to just be hard. And sometimes we just, it's, it's acknowledging that and just saying, I'm going to let it be hard here. As a way to help renew your mind here, okay, in a spiritual way, in a relational way, we're going to ask you to do some journaling every single week here. And it may feel funny. And guys, you may go, well, I'm not really a journaling kind of guy. Well, tough. Become. <laughs> John Wayne journaled. I'm pretty sure. Okay. <laughs> so when your spouse decides to write the sermon for today at 7.30 at night, the night, you know, just the night before, you're going to get upset about that for sure, but you're going to tell yourself it's not, not the end of the world. world. It's not the end of the world. So I want you to say that uh, with us here. Okay, ready? It's, it's not the end of, of the, the world. world. And when you come home and you see the news broadcast that says there's a meteor hurling towards planet Earth and it's going to destroy the whole thing in 30 seconds, yeah, that's the end of the world. <laughs> so anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> Just get over there. Just get over there. Uh, <laughs> Was that on tape? My name is Brittany Brown and I'm the Creative Worship Arts Director at Cassis Church. I sang for the first time in church when I was four with my mom and then um, that kind of started me singing throughout like elementary school and middle school I would sing in choir. My mom can sing, my dad can sing, what about your brothers? none of my brothers can sing at all. Actually my mom, um, her whole family is pretty musically gifted, my grandfather was a music minister and on my dad's side he's got got um, several siblings and I have a ton of cousins and pretty much everybody can sing and we'll have like these big family songs um, or we would do quartets or whatever and then my brothers are tone deaf completely. If they're if they're imitating somebody they can do okay but otherwise it's not good so. I met my husband Matt at Cassis in 2008 and then we dated and um, got married in 2010 and then the following year uh, we had our first son Camden Tyler Brown and he is 16 months old now and is really fun. Cam um, is my favorite thing in life <laughs> besides Matt. Um, he is just really funny and I th I've learned a lot about myself and um, and actually just more about God and his heart for us as children because once you're a parent it puts everything in this different perspective for you um, and just kind of learning and understanding what that unconditional love looks like. I love my job because I get to um, lead worship and singing and worshiping is one of my favorite things and then to be able to do that as my job is really kind of like a dream come true. Um, and I love being with the church as a whole and being able to worship together. I feel like it really, that it's a great picture of what heaven is going to be like one day. I just think that's really exciting. And in that moment, if you think of it in that way, it's really powerful. Well, good morning, Casas. How's everyone doing this morning? Doing all right? Great. A little chilly? Is it warmed up out there? I haven't been out there yet. Okay, good. Uh, well, it's great to have you all here this morning. If you're a guest with us here today, we're so glad that you came. Um, and actually, in the, uh, in the handout that you received at the door, um, there's a communication card. 
And uh, if you could take that, if you could take that and fill it out, we would love it. Um, this is our way to maybe, uh, be able to kind of just get you a little more information about who we are as a church, uh, get to know you a little bit. And actually, if you could today, if you're new, um, right after the service under the cross over here, there's some big uh, double doors. We're going to have what we call our 10-minute party. And so if you could fill this out, uh, we'd love to meet you. If you're, it's your first or second time or you're pretty new here, fill this out. Come and meet us back through. There's a room back in here, and uh, we'd love to just say hi and, uh, and get to know you a little bit. So fill that out at some point today. That would be great. Uh, well, I'm going to have you go ahead and stand up. And we're going to start today, um, actually, we're going to have a big choir rehearsal, okay? I don't know if you knew this about me, but I, used to, I started out in my past life as a high school choir teacher. And so I want to teach you the chorus to, to a new song that we're going to be singing today. So just pretend that you're pretend that you're a big choir. I would say, okay, we're going to have all the sopranos over here, and, but that'll be a little bit messy. So, um, so we're going to jump right in here. This is a new song called Furious. So I'm going to sing kind of slow. You can kind of hum along and learn it, and then I'll have us all kind of sing it together. It goes like this. His love is deep, his love is wide, and it covers us. His love is fierce, his love is strong, it is furious. His love is sweet, his love is wild, and it's waking hearts to life. All right, so that's kind of basic, that's how it goes. I'm gonna have you sing it back with me, ready? Here we go, one, two, three, and. His love is deep, his love is wide, and it covers us. His love is fierce, his love is strong, it is furious. His love is sweet, his love is wild, it is waking hearts to life. All right, so we're going to speed it up a little bit. I'm going to ask you to sing it out a little bit louder, and we'll try it one more time. We go one, two, three, and his love is deep. His love is wide and it covers us. His love is fierce, his love is strong, it is furious. His love is sweet, his love is wild, and it's breaking hearts to land. All right, so you just learned the chorus of the song that we're going to do in just a little bit. But before we do that, why don't you turn to the people around you, give them a nice, warm welcome this morning.
what a joy it is to worship you, to exalt you and lift you up, to declare you and your goodness. Be exalted in us today. Amen. You may have a seat. to see you all here today. Um, I brought this big wad of Christmas lights because this is sometimes what they come out of our box looking just like this. And I'm sure you all can imagine the frustration. You probably had to go through this yourself the last, you know, month, last month or whatever. But anyway, um, when you think about your, your closest relationships, any relationship, your spouse, a good friend, you know, a, a child, uh, an employer, whatever, you know, we tend to get tangled up in those emotions. We talked a little bit about this last week. We kind of get our panties in a twist and, you know, everything gets kind of jumbled up and it's a big mess. And we want to talk today about what it means to start untangling some of these emotions. And the more we can start untangling some of the things that get us all twisted up in knots, the better our relationships can be and the more fulfilling they can be. So that's what we want to talk to uh, talk about today. So, um, I wanted to ask y'all who has, does anybody know who Dr. Phil is or how many of y'all know who, yeah. Everybody knows. I love Dr. Phil. Um, I, Dr. Phil's hilarious because I just, anytime he's up there with, you know, any kind of uh, relational issue, you know, it's just, it's, he's so poignant and he just has such great insight. And I remember this one time there was this discussion with this couple and they're kind of getting, you know, into it. It's a heated discussion. And, you know, he said, she said, and, you know, well, if he did this and blah, 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 blah. And you know what he did next? And I, uh, and then, you know, he would come back. Well, yeah, but she did this. And then I tried to say this. And, you know, and they're just getting more and more heated emotionally. And so Dr. Phil, in his classic way, just sits there and he's like, so how's that working for you? You know, <laughs> I love that. That's my favorite <laughs> sentence from Dr. Phil. So we want you to think about that concept. How's that working for you? And it's what we might call uh, the workability factor. And, and I know workability is probably not a real word, but you know what we mean by this. And the idea here is what really works, because oftentimes when we get tangled up in all of those emotions uh, in, a, in our marriage or in a close relationship, we start doing things and we act out of those emotions. And oftentimes uh, what we're doing uh, isn't giving us or leading us towards what we really want. It's, it's really not working. And it, you can just picture Dr. Phil saying, you know, how's that working for you? And, and the truth is for a lot of us, uh, it isn't working. And uh, part of it is because we want what's fair. Okay, when, uh, when, when we get all tangled up like this, oftentimes there's something that we feel is fair. There's something that our spouse ought to be doing that would be fair. There's something that our spouse should stop doing. And if they would do or stop doing that thing, then it would be fair, right? And we think we would feel better. That's, that's the notion. But here's the truth. <clears throat> here's the truth. Fairness is really overrated, okay? And I know you may think, what? It's totally overrated, okay? And, and here's the reason why uh, we say this. Oftentimes, when we begin thinking of what's fair, what's fair in my relationship, what's fair in my marriage, is it causes us to focus, put a primary focus on that other person. When we think of fairness, we rarely think of what we need to do to make it fair. We think of how we're feeling and it's all jumbled up. And if our spouse, our partner would just do something different, then it would become fair. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. You can't really have what's fair and what's workable at the same time. It's kind of like uh, having a lab. How many of you have a Labrador retriever? Anyone have labs in here? Okay, a bunch of it, yeah. There's, there's an old truism. You can have a lab or you can have a nice backyard, but you probably can't have both. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> they, they Personal just, experience. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Our lab, after she chewed up all the flowers, she chewed up an ocotillo. What, um, what kind of dog eats a whole ocotillo? Okay. Um, and so in the same way, um, in your life, 
especially when it comes to your spouse, you can pursue what's fair, what feels right to you, or you can pursue what really works in your relationship. But rarely can you have uh, both uh, in there. So what we want to talk about here is how do we how do we apply some spiritual principles here that are really workable, okay? And there's two of them that we wanna uh, talk about here this morning. The first one that we're gonna talk about is this idea of learning to let go. And then the next one, uh, and I'll give you the kind of the technical phrase for this, is valuing, valuing. And uh, we're gonna spend some time walking through both of those. But let's start with, so the rest of the morning is gonna be on this idea of, of how do we let go and how do we do this thing called valuing. And we're, we're gonna walk through both of these. So let's start with this idea of letting go. Because this becomes really important if you wanna have a successful uh, marriage or a successful relationship. And I want you to think about all the passages in scripture where the Bible begins talking about forgiveness. You know, think about those passages in scripture that asks us to forgive. And as you begin to study the concept of forgiveness in scripture, you begin to realize that there's this element where in order to forgive, you have to learn how to let go. There are moments when we have to let go. And the key to letting go is uh, in an emotional way is loosening your grip on the things you can't control. Oftentimes, the places that we have the most angst, the places where uh, we struggle to forgive the most are the places that we don't have control. And because we don't have control, we can't change it. And so we hold it against that person. We want them to change and we get all wrapped up expending all of this emotional energy, wishing somebody else usually our spouse, would be different, act different, think different, relate different, but we can't control any of that. And it ends up pulling us in knots when the reality is the kind of life that scripture walks us towards is this idea of to be a forgiving person is the kind of person that can let go, let go and let other people uh, be in, in and around you. Yeah, I, uh, my parents love to tell this story about when I was about two years old, we used to live in Louisiana and um, there, that's where they said there, where flies are like as big as trucks. And, um, and so, you know, they were always out and, you know, bugging you. And I was playing in my own little world, you know, when, as a two-year-old, you got to picture this. And I'm just happy as a clam. Everything's fabulous because I'm doing what I want to do. When this fly decides to, you know, infiltrate my territory and he's buzzing around and he's buzzing around and he's getting closer and I start getting all riled up. I'm like, stop it, stop it, go away. That's not nice. You know, I kept just, you know, getting all tangled up about this fly. And my parents said that there was this, one of their friends just sitting there watching this all occur and he's just trying to, you know, I'm trying to control this fly and he's just tapping his finger and he starts laughing. He said, well, you can't boss a fly. And, you know, it's so funny because we want to boss our spouse. We want to boss our, you know, our partner. We want to boss our children. I mean, and there's an element of that that, you know, is some, we'll talk about that later, but we have to boss our kids a little bit. But, um, but you know, we have all these, we want to control is the basic issue. We want to control and we want to make them change their behavior. We want them to be on time. We want them to engage, you know, in an activity. We want them to be more structured or less structured. We have all these plans of what we want and we're, we get more and more frustrated and tangled up when that doesn't happen. And so then what happens is we start, you know, um, blaming them. We start judging them. We start comparing them to other people or to our own, you know, set of, you know, if they would just do it the way I do it, you know, we start rehearsing the injustices of the world. And what I mean by that is uh, that's what we call it in our house, rehearsing the injustices. And that is, you know, you go through every little thing they've ever done. Well, gosh, when we first got married, they did this activity. And then three years later, they did X, Y, and Z. And then yesterday, it was the 565th time they did not take out the trash. You know, like, you not start... Not that she's counting or Yeah. Anything, but. You, <laughs> I don't count that. Um, but anyway, you know, you just start keeping track of every little thing and jot and tittle that they do. You know, you just, you start keeping track. And then you also can start saying, you know, I'm going to go after this behavior. I'm going to change it. And you start going behind the scenes or you start attacking and you're wanting to take control and all you're doing is getting yourself all stirred up, all tangled up in this emotion. And so kind of what our challenge is to stop and ask yourself, 
how's that working for you? You know, I mean, is it really where you want to be emotionally? Are you, are you glad and, and feeling good about the decisions you've made and how you've treated your, your spouse or your, you know, your loved one or whoever is in your relationship? And, and I think that we want to say that you want to challenge yourself. Is this who God wants me to be? How do I want to act in a relationship? And I think that's what we're trying to get at with this, this notion of letting go, that we can let go of some of this emotion. Yeah, you know, there's a key principle. And if you don't take anything else away from this morning, take this one principle away from kind of what she's saying here. And it's this, your spouse is never a project or a problem to be fixed, okay? Just don't take that project on. And all too often, the places in marriage where we get so tangled up emotionally is that there's some issue or some area within our relationship and there's a part of us that wants to get in there and fix it. And we see them as a project or a problem that needs to be fixed. That's not your job, okay? Let the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit in your spouse's life. You be friend, partner, lover. That's, that's what it is to be married, okay? Not the, not the fix-it person uh, in the relationship. And when we can let go of that notion that we're trying to fix our spouse, um, then it gives us that freedom to begin uh, uh, letting go. And there's a great place in scripture where this, where you see this kind of illustrated in this encounter between Jesus and Peter. In fact, if you have your Bibles, flip over to Matthew chapter 18, Matthew chapter 18, because what's happening is Peter's on this issue and he's got this curiosity going, you know, okay, as a follower of Christ, what does this mean? When somebody out there does something wrong, when somebody offends me, hurts me, uh, how many times do we forgive them? When, at what point uh, do we, we say, you know, I'm not letting go of this anymore. And so you see this in, ver look at verse 21, as Peter kind of sets up the question here. He says this, then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, <clears throat> How many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? And of course, he gives this answer up to seven times, which seemed to be like real reasonable. Seven, that seems like a pretty good number. Seven times. Imagine someone offending you seven times and going back and forgiving them seven times. But here's, here's the issue. I want you to catch this. The way Peter is approaching the problem is, the problem is with the other person. How many times does that person deserve to be forgiven in this? How many times do we let somebody get away with something before we finally say, you know, enough is enough. I'm holding on to it now. <laughs> the, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the gray spigot has just been turned off in your life, dude. You know, it's at what point do we look at our spouse or a friend and just say, you know, you've hurt me enough. You've done this too many times. And now I'm going to hold on to this. There's no more forgiveness. There's no more letting go. And what's really fascinating, and this is where Jesus, I am just telling you, is a, his brilliance, uh, as the son of God and his mastery as a teacher just comes. This is why you got to read the Bible, okay? Jesus takes the whole issue, and I love what he does with this. He completely flips the whole issue up on its ear. He completely reframes the whole question that Peter's asking. Look at verse 22. Here's how Jesus answers. He says, uh, Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Uh, some translations uh, might have seven times 70 uh, times. And the, the point here, Jesus is using this kind of figure of speech and he's not giving a precise number. So don't come away with, okay, it's 77 times or 70 times seven, whatever that number is. 490. 490, yeah. She's better at math than me. Um, whatever number that is, that's not the point, okay? What he's saying to Peter here is, Peter, it's not about a fixed approach. It's not about a fixed approach. Here's the magical number of how many times you let something go. What Jesus comes back to is, Peter, it's really not about that person. It's about you. And it's about the kind of person you will be. See, the issue the issue that gets us all tangled up is when we don't let go of the issues. The issue isn't the issue. Remember we talked about that last week? The issue here is who has God called me to be? Who does God want her to be? Who has he created us to be? And what Jesus is teaching Peter here in this moment is, 
by a value. The nature of who I want you to become in me is a forgiving kind of person. There is no limit to your forgiveness. This is who you're to be is a forgiving kind of person. Isn't this amazing that Jesus does this? And it begins to totally change this whole notion. And so take what Jesus is saying here. And the idea is Jesus would say, you know, take this illustration is you've got to be the kind of person that can let those things go. You've got to be the kind of person who isn't judging, who isn't holding those things. It, it's irrelevant in your marriage, whether that person is right or wrong in there. The issue is, who are you going to be? Will you be a person who can let things go? And here's why this is so important. And this, it, this will play out in everything Angie and I are going to teach in this. You know, here, here's what Peter had to get out of this. Who needed the forgiveness more? The imaginary person that Peter was talking about or Peter? Peter did. See, the reason we need to be forgiving kinds of people is because when we become forgiving kinds of people, this gets untangled. When it, and it doesn't, you can be as right as rain and hold on to some injustice and you know who pays the price for it? You do. You do. If you want to enjoy the kind of marriage that you really were created to have, then you are going to have to learn how to let go of some of those things that feel unfair, feel unjust in your marriage. Because a marriage, right, you can, you can have what's fair or you can have what works, but you probably uh, can't have both. So when we hang on to those offenses, you know, the things that Angie, and you know, of course, there's nothing Angie would ever do that would bug me because I know I never do anything that bugs her. But hypothetically, <laughs> let's say that happens. We had a list. You had, we both had a long <laughs> yes, list. We we're journaling That's like. Right. <laughs> That's right. If I hang on to those things, it doesn't matter if I'm right. In the end of the, at the end of the day, if I hang on to those things, I'm the one that pays uh, the negative price for it. So let's talk about these journaling exercises. Remember last, oh, and do we have those? Are the ushers ready to hand these out? They are fantastic. Ushers, why don't you go ahead and begin handing these journals out? I almost uh, forgot about this. We ran out of these uh, before we got to the third service last week, but uh, the ushers are gonna give one out to everyone. If you don't want one, you don't have to take one, but we have enough for everyone. Um, we really want you to go through some journaling exercises here. Remember last week we talked about Paul. He talks about taking every thought captive. Uh, one of the ways you can do that is journaling, to think through, to process these things. And so there's some journaling exercises that we want you to go through throughout this series that will do an immense amount of good in helping reshape our minds around some of these principles. So with this one, uh, just a simple journaling uh, exercise, and I believe these are in the notes that you were given in the handout, uh, is this, just journal, just take five minutes this week and just journal on some issue that's just bug the heck out of you with your spouse. And again, if you're not married, apply this to a relationship that's uh, very important to you. Maybe uh, it's a close friend, maybe it's a parent, maybe uh, it's one of your children, something like that. What is some issue that has just, just had you all turned up in knots? Journal a little bit about what you did to try and change it and how did it make you feel? And you're kind of asking yourself the question, how's that working for you? Was it working for you? Whatever you did, what you, if you got all amped up and pressured them or whatever, was that uh, working for you? Yeah. Um, I, uh, sorry, hold on one second. Yes, I lost my place. See, he's such a good helper. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so one of the things that I would like to illustrate um, for this is as a parent, I mean, because we, we, we want to share a lot of stories about as a spouse, but one for me that really hit home, and it's actually because God has a funny sense of humor um, sometimes, and that is because we had already started this sermon series, or this sermon, and we kind of had most of it wrapped up by Friday, and I came home, and my two teenage children had the entire house just covered with any kind of food cooking product there was. And like all of my dishes were out, all of my pots and pans were out, everything was out. And there were just chunks and just boatloads of food everywhere. And so I'm just, I come home and I'm like, what is this? And they're like, well, he kind of, you know, just has some friends over and la la la. And I'm like, okay, well, why is it not picked up? And they're like, well, I'm like, okay, I want it picked up. 
So, you know, the next day I get up and nothing is changed. It is the exact same way as it was the night before. And, well, the pizza was a little drier than, than it was the <laughs> night before. And so I was, I was really mad. And I'm, you know, I get up and they're like, all blurry day, hi mom. And I'm like, what is this? And they're like, uh, you know, and I, so I just, I mean, I was like tangled up. I got my panties in a twist. This was me right here. And, you know, I'm just laying into, you know, this is what you're supposed to do and blah, 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 blah. And you're supposed to pick up after yourself and be responsible and la, la, la. And uh, my, my kids called me on this because, see, we talk about how to do these kinds of things. They're like, Mom, you're acting out of your anger, you know. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I know. But what I really wanted. <laughs> that was a great moment. It, <laughs> Yeah, it was for you. You yeah, loved it. Me, You're like, yeah. that's going to preach. But um, <laughs> I'm like, darn, you know, just anyway. But what was happening was I, it wasn't only about my kitchen. You know, Glenn just saying the problem wasn't the problem. The problem really for me was I wanted my children to say, mom, you're so right. Like, gosh, we were so bad. Like, why did we do that? It was so selfish. And we will make this right, mom. We are going to go and this kitchen will be fabulous looking. You know, I mean, I wanted that kind of attitude. I'm just, you know, I think that's okay to expect as a parent. But what was happening was I, having that expectation and being tied and wrapped into it, I was just getting more and more worked up. And I had to take a breath and learn how to just let that part go. I, I mean, I can't make my kids... You know, I mean, I can enforce rules, but I can't make them behave or believe or, you know, have some kind of a, an attitude towards me in a way that, I mean, it's not real to them. And I just have to eat, let go of that. I can't keep wrapping myself up in all of this emotion. That's right. So part of this is in what she went through, this whole thing of letting go. But one of the questions that sometimes comes up is, okay, when I understand this biblical concept of forgiveness, when I understand how to apply this in a relationship, sometimes it feels a little bit like, am I becoming a doormat? To and, let it go. Yeah, let, to, to, right, let it go to let it go. Is that just becoming a doormat? Mm -hmm. And the reality of what we want you to grasp here is no. It's not about becoming a doormat because what happens here is that as you begin to let go of this stuff, that frees us up to do something different. And we want to go back uh, to last week and we want to pick up on this idea of valuing. And here's what we mean by value. Remember we talked last, and if you weren't here last week, make sure you go to our website, watch uh, the message because it pertains to all this. Last week, we talked about this thing that there's a, we all experience uh, different situations. You might call it the stimulus. Something happens, like you walk into the kitchen and it's a terrible mess and your kids promise they'll have it cleaned up by morning and they don't. <laughs> I'm sure that's never happened with any of you with teenagers. Um, and so uh, that's the stimulus. And what happens is when there's no gap between the two, we tend to we tend to act or react right out of that emotion. Our response just comes straight out of it. And the choices we make are emotionally based responses. And we talked about this last week. But here's what happens. As we begin to figure out how to let things go, say, you know what? It's not my job to try and control that person in that way. Not my job to control my spouse is that we create that gap. And this gap between the stimulus and the response, the gap between all the emotion, that tangle of mess, uh, and our choice is the place where good things can happen because this is the place we can act on who God has made us to be. God made you as a human being with dominion. You, you have authority over your own body and your own life. You have a free will. You have creativity. You have, as a creature of God, you have the ability to reflect and choose. And one other thing that you have in here, and this is what we want to talk about here on this next half, remember, part of it's letting go, and then it's what we're calling valuing, is we have values, deep deep values. And we can make a choice that instead of choosing our, our response based on all of the emotion and the stimulus, we can choose a response or actions based on our values. And if you can become the kind of person that can make choices in those jumbled up moments out of your deepest values rather than your emotions you're going to be a much happier person in this world, regardless of your circumstances. So when we think of valuing, when we talk, when we use that phrase valuing, we're talking about making a choice of action based on deep values we have. Now, let us also, we also want to give you a definition 
for values here. When we talk about personal values, here's, uh, here's what we mean by this. Personal values are what you want to do, how you want to behave, or what you want to stand for, okay? So think of them as actionable things in your life. How do you want to behave? What do you want to stand for? So these aren't desires. Sometimes we think of values as like, well, I just, I want to be loved. Well, that's a want or a desire. And we'll talk more about that in weeks to come. But those are okay to have, but exactly. they're not values. Yeah. That's right. Um, a value is, uh, to take the love thing, it would be to say, I value being a loving person. I want to be loving as a, as a value. Um, so personal values are not about what you want from your spouse, okay? Personal values are about how you want to treat them. How do you want to live as a spouse or as a parent or a friend or a coworker or a fellow student or whatever it might be? And it's interesting when you look at scripture, you begin to see this concept uh, that we've talked about here really coming through. In fact, one of one of the places that it comes through so well in Christ's teachings, because Christ understood how God made you and me. And his teaching always reflects this deep insight into how human beings really operate. For example, in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, best sermon ever preached in all of history, Sermon on the Mount, it is primarily a sermon about uh, loving others is what that's, the sermon is based on. And about halfway through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus begins going through all of these concrete examples. And so he says things like, when someone hits you, uh, he says, if someone hits you, what does he say to do in response to that? Turn the other cheek. Yeah, we, we've heard that a zillion times, right? Turn the other cheek. Uh, he talks about if someone uh, comes to you and they're asking for money, you're supposed to give them money. If someone comes to you and they try to steal your coat, well, give them your coat and give them your outer shirt as well. Uh, if someone, you know, calls you a name or, or you've got someone, uh, you know, you've, you've heard it said, uh, what's the one to use? If you, you've heard it said, if, you know, uh, uh, don't murder. Well, I tell you, you know, don't even hate somebody. And we go through all of these things. And here's what I want you to get out of this. Again, master teacher here. Um, when, when you're hit, hurt, betrayed, lied to, how do you feel? Does it make you feel good? Well, no, <laughs> no, you're not like, oh, that was wonderful. I just got hit called a name and lied to. Then they stole my money, you know? No one feels good about that. But you know, when Jesus goes through all of those concrete examples, you know what's interesting about what Jesus intentionally does there? What does he leave out? The emotion of it. He never once uh, uh, talks about the emotion of these situations. Do you, think, do you think Jesus didn't realize that we would feel emotional about those things happening to us? <laughs> no, Jesus knows that when we get betrayed, hurt, called names, uh, stolen, uh, you know, things are stolen from us, we don't like that. That churns us up in knots emotionally. But what's interesting here in the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus is masterfully showing us that our response, how we're to live, is not based out of those emotions. He ignores them. It's not that they're bad. It's that they're to be irrelevant to the actionable uh, things that we do. So in other words, Jesus is saying, you got to let go of those emotions. You choose to live a different way out of those deeper values. And part of what he's teaching us there are things like, take for example, when he says, if someone hits you, turn the other cheek. Is Jesus trying to teach us a new rule that if, you know, if someone starts hitting you or wailing on you, that you're not to hit them back under any circumstances? Well, no, that, that's silly, okay? Um, what he's teaching us there is, if someone hits you, you're gonna have a lot of emotion. Don't respond and be a retaliatory kind of person. You have the ability, even with someone who's posturing as an enemy in your life, to live out of a deeper value that says, I'm not going to retaliate. I'm not going to be the kind of person that retaliates with every single person who tries to hurt me. Instead, I can act in love. If someone uh, steals from me, I don't, I don't have to retaliate. I can treat them in a different way. I don't have to be a name caller with someone who is mean in my life. And what he keeps getting back to are these deep intrinsic spiritual truths 
about being one of his followers that can live out of love, a deep value, the way we want to be, and that this doesn't have to be the thing uh, that dominates our life. And so this is the concept, this spiritual concept that Jesus teaches. And it's amazing what happens when you begin to apply this spiritual concept to your marriage relationship here. Yeah. Um, if uh, The notes, we put some notes in the handout today. And if you'll notice, we have this uh, funnel right here. And at the top, we have listed personal values. And that's kind of what Glenn has been talking about so far. It's the things that you want to be. It's the things you want to stand for. And, and they're ongoing things. They're things that you continually do. I, like some of them might be, I'm, I want to be sacrificial. I want to be hardworking, grateful, truthful, caring, kind, accepting. Those are all personal values that we can have. And so those are right up here at the top. The next level down are relational values. So you kind of start looking at, all right, which ones of my personal values can I apply to relate my relationships? How can I take all of these values that I have and use, there's going to be some that apply directly to my relationships, regardless of what that close relationship is. And then we take it one step further and we, we boil it down to three foundational values. And um, that is connecting, contributing, and caring, and then at some point that those values, we need to, to be um, exercising those in our relationships, that every healthy relationship needs care, connection, and uh, contribution. So, um, but remember, don't forget or don't confuse your needs or your wants with your values. For example, uh, I think Glenn mentioned this, that you, know, you might wanna say, well, I wanna be loved, I need to be loved, and I wanna be accepted. You, you want to take it away from that. Those, and we're going to address those later that it's, those are needs and wants and they're legitimate. But it's, you want to move yourself away from that and saying, but I want to be a loving person. I want to be an accepting person. So try and think of it in, in those terms. So, and apply that, what you, those values to your story in the, in the kitchen. Oh, thing. with the How kids. Because there's, there's more to the story on this thing. How did... Well, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> More to the story. Well, sorry. Well, it's that, good. It's good stuff. Okay, well. The, I was going to tell them about all the dirt. Okay. <laughs> just kidding, so just anyway, kidding. all right. So I'll use my story with my kids. Um, so I told you they called me on it. They're like, Mom, that's not very forgiving. And, you know, and, and so I had to apologize. I had to say, you're right. I'm not, I mean, or not, what did I say? They're not, he, they said, I'm not acting they were like, oh, you're acting out of your, your anger. anger. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's what they said. You're acting out of your anger. I had to say, you're right. And I had to own that. And so, but what I had to learn is I had to decide, and I've already decided this, but I had to think and to widen this gap, what are my values as a parent? My value as a parent is to say, I want to equip my children. I want to contribute. Okay, so one of those foundational values. I want to contribute to my children certain qualities that they can become functioning, uh, happy adults when they leave the nest. That's, that's what I want to do as a parent. That's how I want to contribute to their life. So that's my value, and that's how I widen the gap. So I had to let go of all that emotion of, you know, they should have done this and la, 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 la. And, you know, they're not, you know, thinking I'm great and, you know, all that. I had to let all of that go. I had to, you know, let all that tangled emotion go and widen this gap and then choose, okay, how am I going to act? If I want my kids to, to grow up to be responsible, to be respectful of others, to take, you know, to take responsibility for anything that they do, what am I going to do to teach them to do that? And that allowed me to widen this gap and then act the right way. So my action was, you know what? There's going to be consequences and there's going to be boundaries. And I could still set those up. And they didn't like that either. Of course, they didn't like that. But, you know, I was still able to, to make a decision that was true to who I was deep inside. And that was that I want to be a parent who equips my child. That's the value that I have. And it enabled me to act in that way. That's right. So you can picture how, how that changes everything. So everything, it was no longer about all the emotion around, you know, the kitchen is a mess and uh, all of that. It became this thing about uh, contributing in a deeper way to their well-being. And she's right. They didn't, they didn't like it either way. <laughs> they didn't like it at all. Uh, but 
fundamentally what it meant for them was much healthier. And in the end, they will like it better because she was acting out of the truest part of who God called her to be and what uh, God uh, made her to be. Uh, let me give you an example. Is in Angie and I have been working on some of this stuff for quite a while. And one of the values, I'll give you an example of a, of a personal value for me that I'm seeking to try and apply in our marriage more and more. And it's not a value that I'm good at by any stretch of the imagination. And so you may pick a value and you say, you know, that really matters to me. I want, that's how I want to behave. I want to take a stand for that. I'm not any good at it, but I, that's what I, I desire to live that way. That can still be a value and it may be one that you need to work on. And you may not think of this as a relational value, but for me, it's really become that as I've kind of prayed through this and journaled through this. And it's this is to be candid candid. And uh, you've heard me talk a lot about, you know, I grew up in a, in a wonderful home, low conflict. And so, you know, in our marriage, I've never liked conflict. So if there's some issue that comes up that I'm going to talk to Angie about, and I know, oh man, this is going to be like riddled with conflict and, you know, it's, you know, whatever. I'm like always trying to couch it in some way that is soft and nice. I'm trying to be the great diplomat in the family, you know? What I really want is I want to have things my way and I want her to be in a good mood about it. Is, That's is what I'm after. manipulation, you yeah. know? It's like, <laughs> you can call it diplomo di diplomacy, but yeah. it's not diplomacy, exactly. it's manipulation. But. <laughs> See, it's not worked. If Dr. Phil was here, how's that working for you, Glenn? It's not, Man, yeah, it's that not hasn't working. worked. All I do is make her mad and I, you know, it just, and so but I really- But I wasn't mad. I had a gap there. I was just saying it was manipulation. <laughs> okay, I got you. <laughs> right? Y'all are my witnesses. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> so for me, it's been this thing of saying, okay, um, I, I want to be- connected to her. And, and in our marriage, to be connected, if, if I'm always in this diplomatic mode and I'm always trying to time my questions for her or trying to, you know, always keep it in this smoothed over mode, well, that's not really connecting. I'm not being uh, true. Uh, there's a lack of authenticity there because I'm trying to manage her emotions. I'm trying to manage her. And guess what? She's not something to be fixed or solved. I need to let her be her. And what I can offer up in our marriage is to be candid about those things and not try and manage her in that moment, which can be really hard for me. But here's what I value. I value her as my friend, partner, and lover. I value having a deep connection with her. And so uh, when there's some issue uh, on there that I like that we're going to talk about, what I uh, what I'm learning to do here is to say, okay, everything in me wants to, you know, control it, wants to, you know, try, you know, get my way, but have her be in a good mood about it. I got to <laughs> give that up. And the reality is I've got to create that gap and say, the value that I want to relate with her in here at this moment is just to be candid. It's to simply state the truth of my request or how I feel about something, or my opinion about something, or whatever the issue may be, and you know what? And then let it be. Not state it in a way that is about trying to control her emotionally, but just, here it is. This is what I'm offering up, and if she gets upset about it, let it go, and say, I, she's a big girl. She can manage that. She can handle that. And here's the amazing thing for me is, and this is not easy for me, okay? Is because in those moments, I just, I love it when everybody's in a good mood, okay? <laughs> I just, that's the way I'm wired. But in those moments to say, you know what? What I value more than just everyone in my family being in a good mood, even if it's a little plastic, what I value more is truth and being candid and being truly connected to my spouse and letting her know that, that she is free to be her and that I'm not gonna judge her, I'm not gonna try and control her, manipulate her on anything. And you know what? Ultimately, when I act in that way, um, overall, think of what that does for our marriage. See, when she's not feeling like I'm pushing on her and I don't have some secret agenda that I'm trying to work in there, Ultimately, it brings our marriage into a deeper place of greater intimacy and a deeper sense of connection. And the only way I get there, the only way we get there is when I can take Christ's words on this thing about saying, 
Uh, I've got to let the emotions go. I'm not going to make the decision based on the emotion that I feel. I may feel hurt by her. I may feel angry with her. And it's not that I have to make those emotions go away. You know what you can do? You can just let those emotions be those emotions. Say, you know what, right now I'm angry with her. I'm upset with her. But I don't have to make my decision of what to say or treat her out of those emotions. I can, that's me, I'll just let it be. But I've got this deeper value about being candid along with many others and I'll act out of that. And in the end, it, uh, it begins taking my marriage to a place that I really enjoy and get uh, more out of it in there. Yeah, and one of them for me when, when we've been journaling um, that I came up with and again, just like Glenn said, this is one that I'm not good at, but, but I discovered it's important to me. And that is optimistic. It just kind of dawned on me that um, when I was journaling, you know, we live in such a negative world. Everything's just full of negativity. And um, it's easy for me when things get hectic and crazy, you know, throughout the week. And then the weekend comes up and, you know, I want to connect because we've just been disconnecting all week long. You know, I, I just, it's so easy to go, you know, think about all the things that didn't work. And I wanted to offer something into our relationship that was life-giving. I wanted to be optimistic instead of, you know, just dumping in all this pessimism or negativity. And what I mean by that is just, you know, I didn't want to look at all the bad things. I wanted to be able to say, okay, you know, I don't like that my weekend um, is getting crazy or that my week has been busy. I don't like any of those things. You know, for both of us, the weekend is really hard because Glenn's, you know, got church going on and he's ramping up for the weekend. I'm working on my uh, master's almost to my doctorate and I, all of my assignments in school are due on Sunday evenings. So our weekends are not exactly a fun, you know, a happy train. So I am over here, you know, and I don't like any of that. And so it was so easy. It was getting caught in this pattern of just being like, well, you know, it's just, we don't do anything fun. And, you know, it's just so busy and your schedule's this or, and I don't like my schedule and blah, 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 blah. And so I just kept feeding that. And I wanted, I finally decided, you know what? I, I don't want to be that. I want to be an optimistic person. That's who I want to be. And when I look at, you know, the funnel relationally, I start taking that down to relational value. And then I can say, you know what, that's contributing. What can I can contribute to Glenn that's optimistic? And that's what has widened that gap for me is to say, okay, um, so well, an example would be this weekend, um, I thought we've got three hours, three, four hours on Friday. We're gonna, you know, we can connect. It, granted, it's not the best, it's not the optimal scenario of what I really want, but it's something that I can grab a hold of and we can have a good time and I, you know, we can make the best of it. So I took him to a dude movie. I'm like, you know, it's she not going to be on a date. It's not a chick flick. It was a dude movie. <laughs> it was and great. Um, I'm like, you know, so I even told him, I'm like, now remember, this is a dude movie, not a chick flick. So you got to <laughs> tell your friends that I, you know, and so, um, <laughs> so I, uh, but that was what I was able to do was to, to, you know, look at my value of saying, um, I value being optimistic and I want to contribute something to my spouse that is life-giving. And so I was able to respond and, and choose and, and make an act, you know, choose the activity of the date, you know, despite the rest of not being, you know, happy. That's right. So with your journaling, we'll just wrap this up with this. This week, uh, and the question should be in the, in the handout you have, um, take some time and work through what you think and look at that funnel that's in there. What are some of your personal values? How do you want to live, stand for, behave? What do you want to do? Then look at that list of values, and it may be a long list, but what's really important to you about how you will live your life? And maybe ask yourself the question, who has God made me to be? What, what of these values do I have passion for that I really want to live this way? Then take that list and say, which of these can be applied to a relationship? How can I use these values to, and then go down to that, the foundational values. How can I use those relational values to contribute, care, or connect to my spouse. And if you're not married, to use the same exercise, but apply it to another close relationship, maybe with your parents, your kids, a close friend, uh, something like that. And it's amazing what happens when you begin to take this concept that we see in the, Spirit, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, this idea of responding out of these values and not out of your emotions, how it begins to untangle you and you begin, regardless of what your spouse does, you begin to enjoy your marriage more and more and more because you know what you're doing? You're spending your energy and your effort 
on what works, on what you have control over. And that's always a good thing. So uh, get your, if you didn't get one of these, make sure you get uh, one of the journals on your way out. I'm gonna say a quick prayer here just to close up the message. And then uh, Andy's gonna come out and has a few things for us in our offering. So let me say a prayer as we wrap up the message here. Father, we just thank you for this time. And we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. And just the wisdom and the insight into the entire universe that you gave your son, Jesus Christ. And we just thank you that we can actually read some of his teachings and glean from them and begin to understand how to live life. And I pray that we are able to take some of his teachings and apply them to our closest relationships, especially marriage relationships, and begin to use that wisdom in a way that builds stronger and deeper and more intimate marriages. And we pray this in your son's name. Amen. Well, thanks, Glenn and Angie. That was a great, great message. It's hard to let go, but it's such a great thing to to realize that in uh, and actually just caring for your spouse rather than trying to change them. Uh, it's just really freeing. A uh, great message. Uh, we're gonna uh, just go ahead and take our offering at this time. So we'll call the ushers forward. Uh, and just wanted to mention to you, if you did fill out that communication card, this would be the the time to to put that in the plate. And as we're getting ready for this, I'll go ahead and and pray for uh, pray for the giving of the offering. Dear Lord, uh, we are so thankful, Father. Uh, to be your children and and to be in this place today, God, as we as we give our gifts, Lord, we just we just want uh, you to know, Father, that we're so thankful uh, for the ways that you've blessed us and and the grace that you've given us in your Son Jesus and and all the things that you do for us, Lord. Um, we have grateful hearts today, and as we give these gifts, Lord, we ask that you would use uh, use these gifts according to your perfect plan and purpose. And pray this in Jesus' name, Amen. Uh, well, today uh, we have our 10-minute party after the service, and that's going to take place right over here. I think I mentioned that earlier through the uh, double doors right underneath the cross. And uh, and actually, if you if you have this communication card with you, you can go ahead and bring this with you instead of putting it in the plate. You can bring it right back to us in the 10-minute party. And what the 10-minute party is is basically we'll just be back there ready to meet you. So if you're this is your first week, second week, or, or, or fairly new here at Casas, go ahead and bring this back. We'd love to just say hi and, uh, and get to know you a little bit, and that'll be great. Um, another big, big thing uh, for us as a church, um, we're kicking off the Financial Peace University, and that's uh, by Dave Ramsey. If you're not familiar with Dave Ramsey, he's on the Fox uh, Business network. Um, and this is a really, really successful program. And just uh, personally speaking for my wife and myself, our family, we've been able to pay off uh, thousands of dollars in debt and uh, and actually put uh, put a bunch of money into savings. Uh, so it really works. And we try as best we can to just use the envelope system and pay cash for most things. So great, uh, great program that really works. So if you haven't done that before, I, I encourage you to sign up for that today. And you can do that out at the white tent outside today. And I think the next two weeks we'll be doing that outside. And you can also register at casaschurch.org. Just go to casaschurch.org. Dot org to uh, to register for that. Um, the other thing to mention, if you're new outside, you'll see some red uh, red umbrellas. If you have any questions before you leave here today, or if you're back here next week, just make sure to stop by either the welcome center outside or one of the the red umbrellas, and they'll be able to answer any questions that uh, that you might have. All right. Well, let's go ahead and uh, and stand uh, for a closing blessing this morning. Well, may God bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you. And uh, may God help us all to let go. All right, have a great week. We'll see you back here next week. And if you're new, we'll see you at the 10-minute party.